Since leaving Cresson's peristyle, I've been plagued by questions regarding the man I saw locked in the shed. Unlike classic descriptions of the zombie, this man was not shy, nor sullen. Indeed, he was screaming. It would be equally foolish to blindly trust or completely dismiss what I have seen, but I can say with certainty that it chilled me to the very threads of my cultural tapestry. Today, I'm going back to the rice fields of Artibonite to collect the potions that Croissant has promised. I meet with Alex, who fears Croissant may attempt to rob us, and so has brought his friend from the Special Forces. Hamilton. Serge serves as the personal bodyguard to the President's sister's husband. Alex has brought along a magical potion to protect us. Serge has brought a duffel bag full of guns and takes a moment before we leave to hide one under each seat in the car. Again, we drive for many hours and find the roads completely blocked with a large funeral procession supporting a wooden coffin. As we walk through the fields, I am facing the unknown. I have no idea what to expect from Cresson. He could give me the poison, or poison me with the poison, or shoot me in the face 14 times. We are deep in the country, and should we need help, it will be unavailable. At first, I find this frightening, but I'm comforted knowing that Alex's lithe, agile body will be quick to respond to any threats. We arrive at Cressants, bearing gifts of Barbancourt rum to show our goodwill. He seems pleased, but I'm anxious to see this new poison and how it might differ from the last, seemingly inactive powder he gave me. Can we see the powder then? Yeah. Does he still have any of the ingredients left over? Does he have Yes, Croissant offers to let me see the laboratory where he concocts his leaf medicines, but he says that I must accompany him alone, so Alex stays behind. <laughs> Can you ask him what he was just crushing up? He was crushing up with my spillon. So, maybe. Ah, the skeleton boy. Can you ask him if he has the zombie cucumber? 
Oui, oui. C'est un autre qui a à tout net. Tout ça, c'est des Oui. C'est depuis qu'il m'a travaillé dans le bâtiment. Il n'y a pas de tout. Il a fait déjà. Il a fait déjà. Il m'a fait mettre là. Il m'a fait dans la caméra. The powder is retrieved from a child's coffin and presented to me. I'm delighted to find he has given me not only a poison, but also a new powdered antidote. That's the brown container? How much money does he want for those two bottles? Okay. 15, 16, 17, 18, 1,000 US dollars. At last, my mission is accomplished, yet the man holding the poison has a face strikingly similar to the zombie I saw yesterday. Would Cressant make so shameless an attempt to fool me? I went to Haiti to investigate a mystery, and a mystery is exactly what I found. Upon my return to New York, I bring the powders to the laboratory of my friend, Jason Wallach. <laughs> Hello. I've brought some samples of zombie poison from Haiti. Great. All right, we can look and see what's in these. He subjects the powder to extensive chemical analysis. Say 100 milligrams is probably good to start. First filtering the material to find it contains a large quantity of sand and numerous unidentified hairs, likely of goat origin. The remaining material is then extracted to detect alkaloids and run through TLC and GCMS. When he is finally finished, we can say that we know for certain the secret ingredients. Allele alcohol and methylparaben, two non-psychoactive chemicals commonly found in cosmetic products. And so our powder is inactive. Fake is too certain of a word to use, but pharmacologically speaking, it's certainly inactive. And in terms of TTX content, the potions Davis collected were practically inactive as well. So what can one make of an inactive powder? Within the magical belief system of Haiti, zombification would be possible in the absence of any active drug. That is to say, the pure power of their belief in magic could produce a self-induced psychological zombification. I saw a man in a shed making some unusual sounds. Whether his condition was caused by a bazango bokor, I cannot say. In Haiti, I know the placebo can take on new heights of untold potency, and whether my inactive poison is truly inactive cannot be said outside of that strange Caribbean island. I watched a man in the throes of spiritual possession and swam with the puffer and had a mysterious powder transdermally applied to my forearm, but my search is not yet over. I promised the goddess Erzuli that I would return to Haiti, and I have no intentions of breaking her vengeful heart. We never could prove that Narcisse had gone through this experience. My research was totally misinterpreted by the media. You know, what I had or had not discovered was always kind of uh, exaggerated. I was sent down to Haiti by kind of linear rational Descartian scientists to quote-unquote find the drug that's used to make zombies. Well, no drug can make a social phenomenon. And in the end, instead of finding the drug used to make zombies, I, I found myself, you know, investigating the, 
the sort of the social and psychological and spiritual and political and historical dimensions of a chemical possibility. And the whole purpose of the research in the end was not to sort of prove zombies existed, which it did, but really to take a take a phenomenon that, as I say, had been used in this explicitly racist way and turn it on its head, make sense out of sensation, and in doing so, try to draw attention to the preconceptions and misconceptions and, uh, that we had about this extraordinary worldview of Haitian voodoo, and that this was not a black magic cult, but this was a kind of amazingly complex metaphysical world.